True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 27, The Murder of Sheldine Human. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank those who've contributed to the show's running costs through Patreon or PayPal during the last week. From Patreon, a huge thank you goes out to Nell Marie Ardendorf, Nicolene Yonker, Andrew Toms, and Alta Barnard. And from PayPal, thank you so much to James Ramsey for his contribution. I really appreciate the support that each one of you is giving the show as it helps to expand our research capabilities and pays for new equipment. If you're able to support the show through Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave links in the show notes. As always, any form of support is greatly appreciated, whether it's financial, sharing of episodes, or inviting your friends and family to listen. Today's case involves the murder of a young child. Many South Africans will likely be familiar with this victim's name, as there was a huge outcry when she disappeared, and more so when her body was found. As I researched this case, though, I found that Chaldine's case was a little different. She hadn't just experienced a horrific death. Her life hadn't been all that great either. Her horrific death proved that sometimes there are things that can be done to prevent these tragedies, and it has nothing to do with stopping the perpetrator before they strike. Chaldine's death left a legacy for this country, though, and for every child who would go missing after her. My predominant research resource for this case was the book Bailafelt, a dossier of a serial sleuth by Hanley Retief. So let's get into episode 27, The Murder of Sheldine Human. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Although I would usually start the story with information about the victim's life, I think for this episode I'll get into that after we've discussed the crime. And I'll start with Sheldine Human at the point in her life where she would meet her perpetrator. Sheldine was seven years old in 2007. She was in her first term of grade two at a Pretoria primary school. With her blonde hair and big blue eyes, Sheldine was the picture of innocence. Her favourite colour was pink, and she tried to ensure that as many of her possessions as possible were pink. Sheldine lived with her mother, 47-year-old Elise Human, in a commune in Ernest Street, Pretoria Gardens. 37 other people lived on the same property. Elise was not employed and struggled to make ends meet. There were other children living in the commune and in neighbouring houses, so Sheldine didn't lack playmates. On Sunday the 18th of February 2007, Sheldine had spent most of her time that day playing outside with a young friend who we will refer to as Anna. Anna was a few years older than Sheldine, but they'd got along well and spent quite a lot of time together playing in the garden of the commune's residence, or in a nearby park. The timeline of events that day is a bit hazy, but we do know that at 7 o'clock that night, when Elise Human went to see why her daughter hadn't come in for her evening bath, she couldn't find her. Elise searched the property, knocked on the doors of each of the residents, and looked everywhere else she could think of, 
but the little blonde girl was nowhere to be found. Some of the commune residents joined in, and they searched the surrounding area, including the park, to no avail. As evening settled over Pretoria Gardens, Elise arrived at the police station to report Chaldine missing. Police immediately sprung into action and set up search parties of the surrounding area, searching every room at the commune for Chaldine. But by Monday morning, South Africa would wake up to the now iconic picture of a little girl with a straight-cut fringe in her school uniform, staring out from the front covers of a newspaper, accompanied by the headline, Kidnapped. It had quickly become apparent to the public, as well as the police, that Chaldine had not wandered off. She had been taken. Police interviewed little Anna, Chaldine's friend, and it was quickly determined that the last adult she had been seen with was a 26-year-old man named Andrew Yordan. Yordan was Anna's godfather, and he'd taken the two girls to a nearby park that day. According to Anna, they had all returned to the commune garden, and that was the last time she had seen her friend. Yordan was brought in for questioning. He admitted that he had taken the girls to the park that day, but said that he'd returned both to the commune, and that was the last time he'd seen Chaldine. Yordan was a skinny, softly spoken young man who was well known in the area. He lived with his father and stepmother in a house not far from where Chaldine lived. He delivered newspapers with his father to earn an income. The man had no prior criminal record, and by all accounts he was a quiet, unassuming resident of the area. Days ticked by without any sign of Chaldine, and Andrew Yordan was still denying knowing anything about her disappearance. Police, though, felt strongly that he was involved, and they gathered enough circumstantial evidence to arrest him and search his bedroom. They found no connection to Chaldine, but they did find several newspaper articles about the Lee Matthews case and other cases which Detective Pitt Baylor felt had investigated and cracked. Bailafelt, by that time, was a national phenomenon, having become known as the serial killer cop, due to his involvement in the resolution of several serial killings. I covered the Lee Matthews case, in which the 21-year-old was kidnapped for ransom and then murdered, in episode 16. It was one of the cases that caused Bailafelt to become a household name and a national hero. When asked why he had these articles in his room, Andrew Yordan had simply said that he, like many others, admired Bailafelt greatly and he wanted to build a scrapbook of the cases he had solved. Yordan agreed to take a polygraph test and he passed it and those results, paired with his constant denials and a lack of physical evidence tying him to Chaldine's disappearance, meant that police were going to have to release him very soon. They had almost nothing left to hold him on. Yordan was due to be released on the 6th of March, but on the 5th of March, the investigating officer on the case, Mike Van Aert, decided to try one last-ditch attempt to get the man to confess. He made a phone call to Yordan's hero, Pit Bailafelt. He explained the situation and asked him if he would speak to Yordan. Within hours, Bailafelt arrived at Hercules Police Station and collected Yordan. He transferred him to Brixton Police Station, out of which Bailafelt worked at the time, and had officers place the man in an interview room. Bailafelt would later say that the look on Yordan's face when he realised that he was in the same room with the top cop was priceless. To build rapport, Bailafelt asked all the other officers to leave the room. 
he offered your don a cigarette, and the pair sat smoking. He asked your don why he had articles about his cases in his room, and your don told him that he'd always wanted to be a detective, and that Bailefeld was his hero. Bailefeld spent some time asking your don about his family and his daily life, quite unrelated to the case. He asked the young man if he had a girlfriend, to which he responded that he'd broken up with his last girlfriend some time before. Bellafeld asked your Don if he had had sex with that girlfriend, and he said that he had. He then asked him if he'd ever had sex with an underage girl. Your Don apparently seemed shocked by this, and denied that he'd ever done such a thing. Before getting into Sheldine's case, Pitt wanted to clarify something with your Don. A very similar case had occurred in Durban a few months before, and Pitt was interested in whether your Don had spent any time in the city. He admitted that he had lived in Durban for some time with friends before returning to Pretoria. Pitt then eased into the events of the day that Sheldine went missing. Yodan spoke openly about the day, saying that he'd visited the commune in Pretoria Gardens, and Anna and Chaldine had asked him to take them to the park. He'd agreed, and spent some time watching the girls play on the swings and roundabout. He said that the girls had then told him that they were hungry, and asked for Kentucky Fried Chicken. He bought it for them, and they returned to the park for a while. Bailefeld asked your Don what Sheldine had been wearing that day. He replied that she'd had a pink shirt and a denim skirt on. And what colour were her panties? Bailefeld asked. Your Don initially said, oh no, he didn't know, but then almost immediately said, oh wait, they were pink, eager to help his hero. Bailefeld then changed tack and asked if your Don had pushed the girls on the swing that day. He said that he had. Did you push them from the front or the back? Bailefeld asked. Your Don said he pushed the girls from the back. So how do you know what colour Sheldine's panties were? Your Don stammered and then said, well, he actually pushed her from the front once. So that must have been when he saw them. Bailefeld allowed the admission to sit in the silence between them for a moment before pouncing. He describes looking intently at your Don and then telling him that he knew what he had done. He knew that he had taken Sheldine and killed her and it was now time to tell the truth. In reality, of course, Bailefeld knew nothing of the sort. He suspected it, just like everyone else did, but there was no definitive proof, until your Don teared up and started to spill the beans. Just hours before he was due to be released, 36 minutes after the interview had started, he confessed to his hero and offered to show him where her body was. Bellafelt felt that the first priority was to find Sheldine's body, so he quickly arranged for Mike van Art and another officer with no connection to the case to drive your Don out to the scene while he waited nearby. He soon got the call that your Don had pointed out the scene and been taken back to the police station. Bellafelt drove to the spot and would later say that if your Don had not told them where to find her, they would very likely never have found Sheldine. The place was behind two fresh produce markets, about three kilometres as the crow flies from Sheldine's home. It was rural, and there was absolutely no reason for anyone to be there unless they were doing something that required absolute privacy. Yodan had claimed to have dumped Sheldine's body into a manhole, so arrangements were made to send police officers down into the manhole to recover her remains. 
although it was already getting dark. Police wanted to recover Sheldine's body that same day if they could. She'd already been out there for two weeks, and no one could bear the thought of her spending another dark night in this hole in the ground. Officers were lowered down into the manhole to start the recovery effort. Now just consider this for a second, because I think that these are the moments that we don't consider when we complain about our police force. It's already getting dark. This is a relatively rural area, so there are no street lights. These officers probably only have headlamps. And now they're willingly being lowered into a black hole in the ground, and they'll be considered successful if they return with the deceased and severely decomposed body of a seven-year-old girl. I know, it's their job. But that takes serious guts. Unfortunately, Sheldine was not in the manhole. They searched a nearby stormwater drain and also found nothing. Thankfully, one of the country's top canine teams was not far from the site, and they were called in to see if they could pick up her scent. Within minutes of arriving, the dogs were able to locate her body. It appeared that she had washed out of the stormwater drain and been carried several meters away. Her partially nude body was severely decomposed in the hot February weather, and her face was unfortunately unidentifiable. Initially, identification was made by her gold earring, which she'd also been wearing in the photograph her mother had given police, as well as her denim skirt. Her shirt and torn underwear were found several meters away from her body. When Yodan had confessed, police had arranged to collect Elise and take her to the police station so that they could break the news to her as soon as they found the body. When police told her that her daughter had been found deceased, Elise Human allegedly began to scream, fled the police station, and ran down the road. She was picked up and taken to a hospital where she was treated for several days. Having recovered Sheldine's body, police now needed to get Jordan's version of events. He claimed that what he'd said about being with the girls at the park was true, and he had taken them home. But when they got there, Anna had gone inside, but Sheldine had followed him back out the gate. He picked her up because she was barefoot, and she jokingly knocked his cap off his head and asked him if she could go home with him. Yodan couldn't explain why he'd walked away from the house with Sheldine, but he claimed that he just carried on walking until he crossed over railway lines and he found himself in a quiet area. He explained that he'd sexually assaulted Sheldine and she'd fought back and kicked him in his groin. He'd become enraged at this and put his hands around the girl's neck and throttled her until she stopped moving. He claims that when he realized that she was dead, he'd sexually assaulted her again. Yodan would never admit to actually raping Sheldine, although by today's definition of rape, His admission that he inserted his fingers into her vagina is considered rape, and rightly so. In 2007, you had to have penetrative sex with a person in order for it to be classified as rape. Yodan denied that he'd raped her, but every policeman that worked the case believed that he had. Unfortunately, when the autopsy was held, Due to the severe level of decomposition, it was impossible to tell whether she had been raped. They also could not determine her cause of death. Her tiny body had been exposed to the elements for so long that it disintegrated at the pathologist's touch. No foreign DNA was found on Sheldine's body either. Police therefore had no other choice 
but to take the cause of death that your Don had given them as fact. The South African public exploded in anger at the news of the discovery of Chaldean's remains. Marches were held to demand the return of the death penalty for perpetrators like Jordan, and entire crowds dressed in pink, Chaldean's favourite colour, burned his photograph in testament to their hatred for him. Although he would never have been allowed bail, Yudan was probably safer in prison while he waited for his trial. When his trial started on the 25th of March 2008, more than a year after Chaldean's horrific murder, Yudan seemed buoyed by his sudden celebrity. He sat in the dock with a religious book in one hand and smiled for photographers. His family came over and kissed him, and they laughed together at private jokes. Andrew's family insisted that he was innocent. His sister claimed that he spent a lot of time around children at their home, and the kids loved him. His brother also said that he'd left his own children in Andrew's care on many occasions, and nothing had ever happened to them. Your Don's true character, however, would come out in the testimony of little Anna, Sheldine's friend. During the investigation, it had emerged that Andrew Yordan had been raping his goddaughter for six months before Sheldine's death. The young girl admitted in devastating testimony that she'd been terrified of Yordan, and when they'd been at the park that day, she had seen him looking up Sheldine's skirt. She said that she'd told Sheldine to sit with her legs closed on several occasions, as she feared that Yordan would take Chaldean to his room and rape her, as he'd done to Anna. The young girl was allowed to testify from a separate room, but was asked to enter the courtroom to point Yordan out. She bravely marched into the room, initially shrinking away from the sight of her abuser, but then she'd taken a deep breath and turned, looked him in the eyes, and pointed straight at him. Charges of rape were added to your Don's charge sheet for his crimes against Anna. A social worker testified that Anna had begged them not to tell her mother what she'd said about your Don. She also refused to testify if her mother was in the room. Although one might think that this was due to the child not wanting her mother to find out the horrific truth, the reality became clear later in the trial, when Anna's mother, despite now knowing that Jordan had raped her child for months on end, walked up to the man and gave him a hug and a kiss on the mouth. Anna would later be removed from her parents' care. Andrew Jordan was painted as a man with very few resources. He tested as having a very low IQ, and his defence attorney claimed that his childhood had been difficult because his mother drank and he'd been taken into foster care for a short period. His mental health assessment indicated that he'd always preferred the company of children to adults. He was diagnosed as suffering from paedophilia, as per the diagnostic criteria for the disorder. This is an aspect of this case that I wanted to focus on for a bit, because I've discovered some very interesting things about paedophiles and child sex abuse in general that I wanted to share with you. I listened to a podcast a while ago called Hunting Warhead, and it's really changed the way I think about these subjects. If you haven't listened to Hunting Warhead yet, I highly recommend it. The podcast covers an international investigation into a child abuse ring that operated, or operates, on the dark web. Now, the case in general is both horrifying and sickening, but there were pieces of information that emerged that I found surprising. The first is that the people running the podcast 
refused to refer to the images they found as child pornography. Although this is the term that we all use, they have a very good reason why they say that this term is antiquated and not actually applicable. Pornography is created by two consenting adults, and in its essence, does not display abuse and is not consumed by people for any other reason than normal sexual interest, whatever normal is. To call material created showing minors in a sexual context pornography creates the impression that, firstly, there's some form of consent involved, and secondly, that this material is being consumed by people as a form of normal sexual stimulation. Clearly, neither of those is the case. So the podcast hosts insist on such material being referred to as child abuse material. They feel that by calling it child porn, you minimize the actual definition of what these sickening images and videos actually are. They are not consenting images of people in sexual poses. They are digital documentation of criminal sexual acts against children. That's the first thing that I found interesting. The second thing I found really interesting, and I've seen this in other documentaries too, is the concept of paedophilia being a mental disorder. Of course, that shouldn't be news to anyone, but I think that most of us tend to use the terms paedophile and child abuser interchangeably, and that's not accurate, nor is it helpful. A person who's living with paedophilia is no different from a person living with any other mental disorder in terms of how likely they are to commit a crime. I know, your ears are burning right now, but bear with me. I think that as a society, our deep hatred and disgust for sexual crimes against children has taken us away from the realisation that not every person with paedophilia is a child abuser. Obviously, we'll never know the real numbers, but I think we would be surprised at just how many people actually live with a form of paedophilia and never commit a sexual crime against a child. I mention a form of paedophilia because also, interestingly, there are several forms. Not all people with paedophilia are sexually interested in children of the same age. Some are interested only in teenagers. And yes, others have a form of paedophilia that makes them sexually interested in very young children. With this information, and again, I know you probably want to shout at me right now that I'm crazy, but please hear me out we can start to change the way we see these crimes. By acknowledging that the term paedophile does not equal the term child abuser, I believe that we can also help save children. And this is why I'm asking you to hear me out. In the last few decades, we've started to try and remove the stigma around mental health conditions, such as depression, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. As a result of the removal of that stigma, more people feel supported to come forward for help. And as a further result, we experience fewer negative events involving people who have untreated mental illness. So call me crazy, but if there are people living with paedophilia who are capable of not following through with their urges, then if we can remove the stigma around this mental illness, perhaps we can get more of those people into treatment willingly before they commit a crime. In the podcast Hunting Warhead, they interviewed one of the men who'd become involved with the distribution of child abuse material. And the sad truth emerged that he had sought help for paedophilia. He had approached three different psychologists 
before he'd started committing crimes against children. Two had declined to treat him when they heard what he was struggling with. And the third had at least made an attempt, but the man said that the psychologist was so ill-equipped to even understand his disorder that it made any therapy he tried useless. No one wants to talk about people who rape children. I get that. And I fully understand that removing the stigma from pedophilia is going to be a thousand times more difficult than removing the stigma from depression. But just like we're not going to stop people from developing depression or taking their lives by ignoring the facts, we're not going to help children by sticking labels on people and refusing to think outside the box. Once someone has committed a crime against a child, most mental health experts agree that they are not capable of being rehabilitated. And in those cases, yes, lock them up and throw away the key. Because their anger and hatred is well deserved. Maybe though, we need to start shifting our thought pattern around paedophilia as much as we hate to talk about it. Because our refusal to acknowledge the truth is just hurting more children. We picture paedophiles as dirty old men sitting in darkened rooms, obsessing over their perverted desires. But that's a myth. People with paedophilia don't suddenly decide one day that they have a sexual interest in minors. The disorder often becomes evident as soon as the person becomes sexually aware. And many paedophiles who act on their urges will do so in their teens for the first time. And don't let the gender roles confuse you either. There are women who live with this disorder as well. But I digress, and I took a pretty large diversion there, because we were talking about Andrew Jordan, who did suffer from paedophilia, but he didn't ask for help. And he did rape and murder a child. Andrew Yordan's defence tried to say that he'd given the confession under duress, but they had no answer for how he'd been able to take the police to Sheldine's body if he hadn't been involved in the crime. The state's case was largely circumstantial, as they had no physical evidence tying Andrew to Sheldine or the scene, and the defence did their best to cast doubt on his guilt, or at least his sole involvement, by referring to some strange pieces of evidence which had appeared during the investigation. One was an eyewitness account saying that Sheldine had been seen in a vehicle with two males on the afternoon of her disappearance. The other was the fact that another suspect had been looked into before Andrew was arrested. This man was identified during the initial search for Sheldine and he would eventually be found to be connected to 13 child abuse cases. This suspect is referenced in an SAPS statement, but they said that the man was not linked to Sheldine's murder. One source that I read said that the man lived in the same commune that Sheldine did. Andrew's family swung between claiming that he was completely innocent and saying that if he was involved, he hadn't acted alone. Another defence tactic produced some interesting and alarming information about Sheldine's life. Jordan had said in his statement that the girls had spent time with him because they were not getting food or attention at home. During the police's investigation, as is very normal in these cases, They looked at the parents first, and so they uncovered quite a bit of information about who Elise Human was as a mother, and what Sheldine's life had been like. This would not have been brought to court if it wasn't for the defence wanting to use it as mitigating circumstances to an extent. Before I get into this, I do want to say that I am not certain what part of this formed from the police's investigation and which was simply statements made to journalists. 
I would ordinarily never climb into the reputation of a mother who'd lost a child. But if the claims that have been made are true, it's an important part of Chaldean's story, and in the opinion of some, may have played a role in her death. It emerged that a week before Chaldean died, she fainted from hunger while at school. When Anna was interviewed, she told social workers that Chaldean only ate three times a week. Yes, you heard that right. Per week, not per day. Other residents of the commune would confirm that Chaldean was constantly asking people for food. Elise denied this, saying that she had often gone to bed hungry, but Chaldean always ate. Had her body not been so decomposed, the pathologist may have been able to pick up signs of malnourishment. Elise Human met and married Chaldean's father, Vickers, when she was 40 and he was 26. Their marriage didn't last very long, as Vickers claims that Elise drank excessively and would go out to clubs and bars and leave him alone with Chaldean up to three or four times a week. When Chaldean was one years old, they split up. Vickers paid 500 rand a month in child support, but he claims that he was rarely allowed to see Chaldean. He would go on to say that on many occasions, he'd asked Elise to let Chaldean come and live with him, but she refused. He believed that she only did this because she wanted the money paid to her every month. Of course, we don't know whether that's true. Sixteen months after Chaldean's death, independent newspapers released a report stating that they had been advised that Child Protection Services were investigating Elise. Neighbours at the commune had made accusations against the woman. One said that Chaldean was better off dead than alive and living with Elise. Another said that Elise would go out at night and lock Chaldean in their room in the commune. One night, Chaldean had accidentally set the room alight, and residents had to break down the door to rescue her. Vickers alleged that Elise had tried to sell Chaldean to one of his relatives. When Chaldean was five years old, she was sexually abused, and a case was opened, which Elise ended up withdrawing. Vickers had been advised of the case by Child Protection Services, but only found out much later that the case had been withdrawn. When asked by journalists if Chaldean was abused in the past, Elise replied with no comment. Two weeks before Chaldean disappeared, Elise Human took a loan of 30,000 rand from three different loan sharks. She gave 10,000 rand of this money to a man called Whitey, who was her sometime lover. Whitey was friends with Andrew Yordan. The other 20,000 was never accounted for. But please do keep in mind that teacher said that just a week before her death, while her mother allegedly had 30,000 rand in her possession, Chaldean was fainting from hunger. The man called Whitey disappeared after Chaldean's murder and has never been located again. A neighbour alleged that on the day that Chaldean disappeared, she was outside because her mother had ordered her to leave the house because she'd taken ten rand from her purse. This neighbour recalled hearing Chaldean crying as she was chased from the home, that she'd only taken the money because she wanted to buy something to eat. Then it emerged that Chaldean was not Elisa's first child. She had a son, some time before she gave birth to Chaldean, but this child was removed from her care. Vickers had had no idea that this child existed, and, bizarrely, Elise refused to admit that the child existed. 
in a heartbreaking twist, three months before Chaldine's death. Her father had saved up and hired a lawyer to sue for custody of Chaldine. He unfortunately lost the case, and it cost Chaldine her life. The vicar says that he found out that his daughter was missing when Elise phoned him to say, She's gone. Sorry, I don't know. He claims that there was no emotion in her voice when she told him that. A neighbour had also told a journalist not to fall for Elise's so-called crocodile tears. She claimed that Elise could switch her tears on and off, on command. Elise received several donations from benefactors after Chaldine's death, including a brand new car. Chaldine's funeral was paid for in full. I must emphasize again that we have absolutely no idea how true any of this is. I tend to believe Vickers' statements because he has no reason to lie. The things that there are records of, like the other child, the abuse case, as well as the huge loans, cannot be denied. As for the neighbor's claims of abuse and neglect, well, it's all good and well that they're coming up with this after the fact, that perhaps they should consider how complicit they are for not having done anything. Not a single one of those 37 people in that house ever reported Elise to child protection or the police, but they have a lot to say to journalists. Maybe that is harsh, but so were the conditions that they were alleging the seven-year-old child was living in. But everyone just kept their mouths shut when it mattered. While the claims were investigated against Elise, she was never charged with anything. In sentencing Andrew Jordan, though, the judge took a little bit of a different stance than would be normal in a child murder case. He showed very little sympathy for Elise Human and told her that it appeared that her daughter was forced to live a very difficult life before she was murdered. Elise burst into tears and stormed out of the court. Andrew Jordan was given a life sentence on the 9th of June 2008, plus three years for abduction and ten years for attempted rape. He was also sentenced to 15 years for the rape of his goddaughter, plus five years for indecent assault. Two missing persons advocacy groups formed in the wake of Chaldine's death, Missing Children South Africa and the Pink Ladies. Both organisations do amazing work in helping the families of missing children and adults. And honestly, I can think of no better legacy for Chaldine than other missing people being helped in her memory. Despite the allegations made against Elise Human, she still receives a lot of support. She does an annual bicycle ride in memory of her daughter and maintains that she did her best to give Chaldine a happy life. In 2016, Andrew Yodan was beaten to death by his cellmate in prison after an alleged disagreement over a football match. His family reiterated their belief that Andrew was innocent and that his murder simply compounded the injustice that had been done to him. I must respectfully disagree. Justice is a funny thing, and sometimes it turns out differently than you expected. Elise, too, seemed to feel that Andrew's death had stolen answers from her. She also seems to think that there was more to the story than was revealed. I don't know, really. There are some very odd circumstances there, but all in all, I think that the right man was in jail. He didn't guess where Chaldine's body was, and if someone else had been involved, surely he would have said something. I think that Andrew Yodan's pedophilia got the better of him and he wanted to have a sexual encounter with a child, and when she fought back, he killed her. 
perhaps her murder was even part of that fantasy. He'd abused Anna, but he threatened her, and she didn't tell anyone or fight back. Despite his low IQ, I think he was smart enough not to kill one of his nieces or nephews. He needed his family to back him up, after all. And they did. I do believe that Chaldine did not have a happy seven years on Earth. I'm sure that there were moments of joy, and I guess she knew no better. I don't agree that she is better off dead, though, and I think that statement is a cop-out. She would have been better off if someone had grown a spine and done something to help her. Why the court decided that her father was not a good fit for custody, I don't know. But such decisions are made every day, with the assumption that a child is automatically better off with its biological mother. Chaldine was let down by a whole lot of people. There's no doubt about that. But the guilt for her death rests solely on the shoulders of Andrew Yodan who got off far easier than he should have. If you're left with a feeling of sadness after listening to Sheldine's story, please go to the websites of Missing Children South Africa or the Pink Ladies. If you can, please make a donation to one or both of those organisations so that they can continue with their vital work. If a donation is not possible, please join their Facebook profiles and make a point of sharing their missing person posts. Because every time you do, Sheldine Human's memory lives on. Thank you for listening to episode 27. The Murder of Sheldine Human. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the app you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I usually release a full episode every two weeks with a mini-sode in between. But during lockdown, I'm releasing a full episode every week to give you more to keep you busy during this difficult time. I'll be back with a new episode next week. So until then, thank you for your support, keep safe, and I'll chat to you soon. <laughs>